If you're watching this review, then you're probably not the super traditional BMW X5 sort of buyer who's after that wagon body. You're probably more enticed by the sportier vibe and coupe shape of the X6 that I have before me. And if you're one of those individuals, I say bravo, because if nothing else, what is life for but for actually living? Now, this BMW X6 has been around for what feels like a million years now, just like its close competition, the Audi Q8 and the Mercedes-Benz GLE. In fact, this first launch back in 2019. However, the one that stands here before me has recently been given a life cycle impulse update, which is essentially BMW speak for a mid-cycle refresh. And it's brought with it a number of changes that we've recently seen on the 3 Series and the even larger Big Daddy X7 SUV. This refresh includes everything from a bit of a spruce up to the exterior styling, also the interior, which is a little bit controversial, and of course, because this is a BMW with performance at front of mind, there's also been an update to that beautiful straight six engine under the bonnet. This one right here is the 40i X-Drive, which is the straight six petrol. It starts at about 145 grand before on-roads or options. You can go for a straight six diesel, which is a little bit cheaper and has much of the same equipment, or you can step up to a twin turbo V8 variant. That's been renamed from M50i to M60i. And let's not forget, we do have that X6M at the top of the tree. However, I do think this straight six petrol does have something unique and special to offer as a bit of a sweet spot in the range, and today I'm going to talk about why. Now, before we get started on today's video, please don't forget to like, comment down below, and subscribe to Chasing Cars if you want to see more content like this. Now, the LCI update for the X5 and the X6 landed towards the end of 2023, and it brought with it a number of styling updates. One key point of difference between the Wagon X5 and the coupe-shaped X6 is that the X6 comes exclusively with the M Sport package on its more cooking variants. This one in particular has got the M Sport Pro package fitted, which means that you have a more darker shade on the grille here and some other accents around the car. As far as details pass through in the facelift, well, you probably notice that the headlights are a little bit slimmer, about 35 mil slimmer than they were before previously, and you've also got a bit of a redesigned lower bumper here. The changes at the rear are much less. There's a bit of a tweak to the diffuser, but for the most part, it's pretty same old, same old. The one that we have before us here rides on 22 inch wheels. You get 21s as standard. However, I do really like the look of these 22s, especially in this black coloring. It gives it a really mean contrast between this beautiful color and also the dark accents of the car. Very nice indeed. Coming into the interior now, there's one major change which dominates this space, and that is the addition of these two huge touchscreens we have before us, although it really kind of feels more like one. We've got a 14.9 inch multimedia display connected in a bit of a curve to the 12.3 inch display. Previously, this was kind of housed within the dash in a more traditional fashion, whereas the multimedia screen sat by itself. However, the biggest change is the fact that we have really just ditched a good deal of the physical buttons here, specifically those relating to climate control. And I definitely think this is a bit of a step back for the X6, just as I did with the recent LCI updates to the X7 and the 3 Series when I drove those vehicles. I think one example which shows the downside of this situation is that not only is it more difficult to use on the move, but when I get into a really hot car, which happens a lot in Australia, specifically today, as you might be able to see on my forehead, the first thing you have to do is you have to get in and you have to click the waiver that comes up in every single car nowadays, and you go, okay, you know, I'm not going to drive this thing into a tree at speed deliberately, whatever. And you have to do that before you can even touch the climate control. And it's just an extra step to do something which wasn't hard to do before. And I can't really see how that's anything but a step back. So look, unfortunately, that is a bit of a downside of that new design choice. But it's good to see that BMW has still retained the iDrive controller, which is a bit of a favorite of mine. And I think something that makes me enjoy BMW interiors more than Audi or Mercedes-Benz because you do have that mechanical takeover so you don't have to be reaching out and taking your eyes off the road more than you would perhaps with this toggle. It also goes beyond convenience in a way. I remember when I was reviewing the BMW iX1 which has recently adopted 
operating system eight, like a lot of BMWs and this whole new styling suite with the larger screens. However, it ditched the iDrive controller. And one of the people in the comments commented that they have an issue with shaky hands. And as a result, if a car doesn't have an iDrive controller or something similar like Mazda offers, then they aren't really able to use multimedia screens. And that's a really good point. If you're someone who, for whatever reason, doesn't have great control over their hands, or you're just a little bit older, then I think you'll certainly enjoy that staying inside the cabin. As far as using this touchscreen though, well, it's a bit of a mixed bag. I think first of all, when you open it up and you have a look at all the apps that are on offer, it's just information overload, you know? It feels like way too many apps and it feels like they should really separate these things into more clear submenus with a more clearer design. But after spending some time with it, it does begin to make some more sense. I noticed that as a part of BMW's subscription services as well, they've also started incorporating some weather apps and some news apps. And it's great to see we're progressing the usability of these multimedia screens, but I think we can go further. Like this is a nearly 15 inch touchscreen. Why aren't we seeing some more entertainment software apps like YouTube or Netflix? You know, like even though this is a petrol car, not an EV that's going to be spending hours charging up at a public charger, I do think lots of people are going to be sitting, waiting to pick up the kids from school, waiting for a friend to get off the train when you're picking them up. And it's great to be able to have a little bit more multimedia usability with these screens. They're huge, so let's do something with them. Anyway, that's just my two cents. As far as build quality goes, look, it's pretty rock solid in here. All the buttons feel nice and clicky. The center console doesn't move all that much. The only thing I will say is that this carbon fiber inlay here, which was going to set you back an extra $1,700, by the way, when you come down to some of the finer details, like this hideaway cover, it feels like they haven't sanded the edge here, and it looks really crappy. It looks like someone's just got a bit of PVC plastic or something like that, and they haven't quite smoothed it over. So, I don't know, bit of an interesting addition there. Wish they paid a little bit more attention. Now, of course, BMW offers a multitude of stereos like they do with a lot of their top-spec vehicles. This one comes with the Harman Kardon 16-speaker sound system. You get that through an optional package. And I've quite enjoyed using it this week. I don't think it's the best sound system I've ever used, and I think it will cater to a good range of listening preferences. As far as more fundamental things like the seats, these are kind of interesting. You look at the shape of them and you can see they bulge and they weave and there's all these lovely patterns. But I think the end result is something that does feel a little bit too busy. You do have a great range of adjustability though. I will see that. You've got four-way lumbar adjustment so you can really get yourself dialed in, but I think it feels mm, perhaps not quite on the ball. Deputy Editor Kurt, for example, was comparing them to his Lexus RX, which has some particularly fantastic set of seats, and I think there is certainly more to be said for the more simplistic design of the seats in that vehicle. It's good to see that BMW has packaged in heated seats as a standard for those up front, but probably equally disappointing that they don't have a ventilating function without going to an, an additional cost extra package on that one. You also have to spend extra to get heating in the second row on this grade. That's probably more fair enough and the same goes for getting a heated steering wheel and even some pretty clever things like a heated center armrest and heated side doors. And I think the one that probably blows me away the most is you can get an optional heated and cooled cup holders. That is pretty surreal, but it's there if you want to pay the extra money. Now, I am nitpicking when it comes to the shape of the seats. For the most part, I have found them pretty comfortable. I think my only main criticism is the fact that my head gets pretty darn close to touching the ceiling in this one. It actually was touching the ceiling when I first got in before adjusting my seat. And of course, I think that's partly to do with the fact we have a panoramic sunroof fitted as standard. So perhaps if that wasn't there, that might provide a little bit more headroom. But alas, that was kind of surprising to see in a bigger vehicle like this. But anyway, speaking of headroom, let's jump in the back and see what that's like. Jumping into the back now, and my headroom problem up front certainly gets a lot worse in the back here. My head and hair are rubbing on here, and I think that's certainly more the result of the coupe shape of this vehicle, which might be a little bit disappointing given its size. Perhaps you've got teenagers who aren't fully grown yet, this won't be as much of a problem, or shorter adults, but even still, it's certainly something to consider. In terms of other space metrics, I've got heaps of knee room, heaps of toe room, though my knees do sit a little bit higher, I think. The seats do hug you, though, for the most part, and I think you could get away with having three people abreast here. There's a good amount of room in that center seat, and there's not too big of a hump in the floor. 
As far as amenities goes, look, we do have the air vents down here, and because this is a three-zone climate control vehicle, we've got a bit of temperature adjustment here via this third little wheel here. I think it would have been a little bit nicer to see a digital display as we have on some more affordable SUVs out there, but alas, it works anyway. BMW has also fitted this clever little accessory port here, which you can use to put in a number of things, but mainly it's designed to hold an iPad or something like that, and you have a USB-C port here beside it to keep things straight charged up. It's also an additional 12 volt socket towards the bottom of the floor there, but for the most part that's pretty much it as far as amenities go. But how does the back seat go with baby seats? So step number one is opening the door, obviously, and I think you'll find that's where our first problem is, because this door doesn't open very widely at all. In fact, to the point where if I put down the baby seat for a second and I come over here, you'll see that me as an adult just standing here would have a bit of a squeeze just kind of getting in the door. So I definitely think there can be some improvement there. But anyway, back to the baby seat. So if I pick it up like so and put it in, it kind of just fits. And I think that's particularly disappointing given the fact that I've already put the front passenger seat as far forward as it can go. Whereas some other vehicles out there, mid-size SUVs that are much smaller than this one, do not have this same issue. I'm not really sure why the X6 is so bad at fitting baby seats in the second row, especially given that adults are able to fit in the back without too much hassle. I suspect it's due to the rear seats being pushed forward a little bit more to maximize that boot space and also the longitudinal engine taking up that extra front cabin space. But alas, a surprisingly bad mark for the X6 here. Depending on who you are, the rear of the X6 is either the best or the worst part of this vehicle. We open up the power tailgate, of course expected at this price point, and we reveal a 580 litre boot. Of course, that is down on the 650 litres in the X5, but that certainly doesn't tell the whole story. Now, I don't like to give generalizations and say, for example, that the uh, more coupe-shaped or sportback variants of these SUVs have less cargo than their wagon variants, as while that is generally the case, it often doesn't say the whole story. Now, this one does have a bit of a fairly steeped angle on the back, and as a result, you don't have a very tall boot. It does go really quite far in, and this week when I was ferrying my family around and I had my pram in the back, I was delightfully surprised to see that I was able to put it right in the back here and still have plenty of room to put shopping bags and such. So that's certainly a bit of a win, but of course, with those taller items, you are going to struggle. You've got this little extra cargo blind here, that can come down here, cover your goods, but I think most of the time this would either be up like this or in your garage out of the way. There are some nice other things back here. You've got a 12 volt socket and you've also got a couple of shopping bag hooks, so that's very nice. But I think the thing that really impressed me about the boot back here is first of all, I open up this boot lid and it's got a gas strap under there, which is absolutely lovely. But also it reveals that you've got a space saver spare wheel, which is unfortunately a bit of a rarity for this class, but it's great to know you've got that. And on those particularly bad days when you do have to change the tire yourself, at least this gas strap holding this up is gonna make the whole exercise just a little bit less miserable. So look, that's certainly very nice. But all in all though, look, I would certainly prefer the boot of the X5 particularly given that the X5 has a very clever boot because you have that split opening tailgate, which I really love because it's easy to just open up quickly one half of the boot and then put in the rest of your shopping and be on your merry way instead of worrying about this giant thing smacking into some pipes overhead at a car park. As you would expect for over two tons of metal, glass and rubber, this perhaps isn't the most frugal thing on the road, but you might be surprised at how frugal it actually is. BMW has rated its combined consumption at 9.3 litres per 100 k's, which notably is actually 0.3 of a litre more thirsty than it was pre-facelift. In terms of our testing, well, this week I've seen an average of about 10.4 litres per 100 k's, which honestly I was pretty impressed by, though if I had to be picky, I'd say I had a bit of a highway skew there. When it comes to servicing, things are a little bit more complicated. BMW's introduced a bit of a different policy where it's more of a service-as-you-go type situation rather than traditional intervals. So 
In your basic package you get there, it covers you for five years and 80,000 Ks worth of maintenance, and that starts at $2,750. You can go up from there, so it adds more things as you go along, but best to look into the details. And finally, BMW covers you with a five-year unlimited kilometer warranty, which is pretty standard for the industry, though we would like to see a little bit of growth here, of course. So what's it like to drive the BMW X6? Well, I wasn't actually the one to pick this one up from the center this week. It was my colleague, Zach Adkins. And when he walked through the front door, the first thing he said to me was, geez, mate, that is a big beast. Keep an eye when you're driving it. And I can definitely see what he means. Upon first getting into the cabin and heading off home, it's a little bit of a mystery because it's a big car that feels even bigger than it actually is. And I think that's down to a few reasons. One, the bonnet, it's kind of hard to see where the edges actually lie. And then two is these mirrors, they're a bit short and they're a little bit more zoomed in than I would like personally. And then three, I think because it doesn't have that traditional sort of wagon bodied shape, you don't have a definitive idea of where the rear of the car actually ends. So that's a little bit interesting. Overall though, I think the visibility is okay. You know, like you got a bit more of a slimmer profile. The view at the back isn't actually as terrible as you might think, considering the exterior shape of the vehicle. And you do have some clever tech in here as well that can aid with some visibility, particularly when it comes to parking. So this is a car that most people are going to drive every day. So let's talk a little bit about how it performs that task. Now, yesterday I actually had the day off. I was looking after my little girl who's not very well at the moment and this was the chariot which I used to ferry her to and from the doctors, which I find is always a good test for a vehicle like this because it's, it's a time where you want to have a ride that's comfortable, you wanna have a cabin that's also quite quiet and it's kind of interesting actually because a few weeks ago I had a similar circumstance when I was driving the Audi Q8. And so I've got two takeaways from that experience. The first is that kids are always sick and the second is that large luxury SUVs are certainly good for the task of ferrying around sick little ones. Because for the most part the X6 was pretty good at its task. The cabin is quite hushed, and especially I noticed when I was on the highway, this thing was just an absolute dream. When you've got those loud trucks around you, people with modified exhausts, none of that is really all that relevant to the interior of the BMW X6. It blocks them out and you can just get on your merry away. The ride on the highway is also pretty good for the most part. It's fairly well resolved, if perhaps not the most resolved in its class. I do think that Q8 I drove the other day was perhaps just a little bit more resolved in that regard. And this was highlighted more so when I went into the urban areas, you know, a lot of torn up back streets and things like that, lots of potholes. And I think there was just a bit too much vertical movement. Now, this one comes standard on adaptive dampers, not air suspension like I thought actually, because the adaptive dampers, they do behave in a similar way to air suspension. Those of you who have driven the more advanced air suspension vehicles will know they have a bit of a trait for a bit of floating, a bit of bouncing up and down and things like that. And surprisingly, the adaptive dampers do mimic that behavior. I had a bit of a play with the modes and I had it on comfort for most of the time being that I was just driving around town. And that is probably when I noticed the most amount of vertical movement and things like that. I stick into sport and you do get a little bit less movement, a little bit more body control, shall we say, uh, that obviously there is that trade off for a more harsher ride. And I don't think that when you flick back from the sport mode to the comfort mode, that you necessarily get that trade off in having more comfortable suspension in relation to how much body control you lose, if that makes sense. And I think what this boils down to is the BMW is obviously trying to be the most athletic of the German trio. The others of course being the Audi Q8 and the Mercedes-Benz GLE. And it certainly does succeed in a few different regards. It really does have its moments of brilliance, the X6. You punt it around a corner and everything just synergizes. The steering is really great. And when you're on the right piece of road and everything simply synergizes, it is a great vehicle to drive. However, I did notice that there are times where it does just kind of fall apart, where it does fall victim to its 2.1 ton curb weight. You know, this is a heavy vehicle and this is a big vehicle and you need to be conscious of the things that you realistically can and cannot do. And this does seem to be something that BMW is struggling with as of late. Not long ago, Kurt drove the XM, 
which is of course an M only vehicle. This is not an M vehicle, this is one of the more cooking variants of the BMW range. And even that vehicle struggled to contend with the amount of weight that it had on board and trying to get things around a corner fluidly. It's not impossible, but I don't think the X6 has it 100% nailed in, at least in regards to handling. However, the one thing that I do think BMW has absolutely nailed with this X6 is the modifications they've made to the B58 3 liter straight six turbocharged engine on this thing. It is just a beautiful engine and it's a beautiful engine in multiple applications. In the recent update, it's now producing 280 kilowatts of power and 520 newton meters of torque, giving it an increase of 30 kilowatts and 70 newton meters. And those are pretty significant increases. And I don't think that as a result of the increased power that it's reduced drivability. This is still a beautifully smooth engine. And one of the reasons for that is also the fact that they've tied in a 48 volt mild hybrid system. And it's actually a proper one. It's not one of these silly ones that doesn't actually do much. It sits between the engine and the eight speed transmission, and it's capable of providing an additional nine kilowatts of power and 200 newton meters of torque. These are the mild hybrid systems that we like to see. And of course, because it's an electric motor, you can also add that 200 newton meters of torque pretty much instantly. And it really does give you some beautiful shove off the line while still giving that straight six engine the time to breathe at those higher RPMs. And when all of those things work together, you really do get something that's quite magic. So I said before that 520 newton meters is the peak torque, and it is, but that's just for the engine. Once you couple it with that mild hybrid system, it brings you up to 540 newton meters. These are pretty serious numbers for what is essentially one of the entry level engine variants of the X6 range. And I've certainly learned to love that when driving it this week. But even beyond the power figures, I think one of the reasons that this engine is so great is not just because it's quick, but also because it sounds quick. It really gives you a presence of power when you're in those early RPMs and you're accelerating up to the highway. And I think that's going to result in one of those instances where you think to yourself, geez, I'm glad I bought myself an X6, or perhaps more broadly, geez, I'm glad I bought a BMW, because they do do these straight sixes just so well. Now, I will note when it comes to the eight-speed automatic, there were times when I think that this transmission and myself weren't synchronizing. Now, of course, nowadays cars are a little bit more complicated than they used to be, and they do learn how you drive over time to get a little bit more in sync with how aggressive you drive and things like that. But I do think that perhaps when I was in sport mode, it could be a little bit more on the ball and it hung onto gears just a little bit too much. And on the odd occasion, I did find myself putting it into manual mode. So, you know, perhaps there could be some improvements there, though I certainly don't think it's a devastating reality of the X6. Lastly, let's talk safety. Now, the BMW X6 doesn't currently hold uh, an ANCAP rating of any kind, really. There is one currently for the closely related X5 for this. However, that is due to expire at the end of this year. And the model that was tested is a bit different to what the X5 and X6 have evolved into today. In the latest update, BMW has added a few extras such as more advanced AEB, which is more capable of detecting pedestrians, cyclists, and also when you're turning across traffic, junction AEB that's often referred to as. You also have an exit warning, which is really great for kiddos that are jumping out into traffic and things like that. So you've got more of an idea of when things are coming along. In terms of the calibration of the safety systems, for the most part, I've found them to be pretty good. You know, they're not too intrusive. I haven't really had anything beep at me. The times when they have beeped at me is when they probably should beep at me. Perhaps the parking sensors could be a little bit, you know, a little bit more tame here. It creates a bit of a feeling of paranoia, actually, because you have that limited visibility and the parking sensors are hyper aware. You think you're going to hit things that you're not going to, but, you know, perhaps it's better that they scream at you rather than not in that regard. Sure, plenty of people think that a coupe shaped SUV is a bit of a silly idea. However, in 2023, I think it's notable that one in five Aussies looking for a BMW roughly this shape and price went for the more expensive and less practical X6 over the more traditional X5. And in some ways that's surprising and in others it's really not. You see, in Australia, we're a very conservative bunch, especially in our buying tastes. And I think it's notable that we've really clung on to this idea and it's happening all over the world, to the point where newer brands like Genesis are set to introduce their own coupe-shaped large luxury SUV in the GV80 in 2024. 
Personally, as a family man, I place a high value on boot space, and I'd rather pocket the $6,000 extra that it costs to go for the X640i over the X540i and put that into something like accessories or, you know, maybe a nice holiday. However, after spending some time with the X6 this week, I can certainly see the appeal of its more unique shape, and depending on your situation, its drawbacks and practicality may not even really affect you. But all that aside, I do think the LCI update has been a bit of a mixed bag. Exterior-wise, I think it looks markedly better. Same for the interior, though I do think that space has lost some usability in a bit of a pursuit of fashion. And I think that once buyers leave the showrooms and get these things out onto the open road, they may not actually find that that payoff is worth it, at least in my opinion. I'm also not entirely sure that even after the power and handling updates, that the X6 meets the brief as a more sporting plus size large SUV that its visual appearance seems to allude to. It doesn't really seem to be as buttoned down or have the fluidity when you're on the move to really reach that dynamic excellence that we've seen in some of BMW's other vehicles. Also, in an era where we're transitioning towards electrified vehicles, it's a bit of a shame that BMW hasn't offered a plug-in hybrid system for the X6 like they have the X5. Audi has made some inroads in this space recently by introducing a plug-in hybrid version of their Q8. As far as fully electric vehicles, well, this one doesn't really have an equivalent. We do have the iX, but nothing in this sort of form factor as of yet. So I guess it's a bit of a wait and see exercise for that one. However, there has been one thing which I really love from this latest update, and that is that straight six engine. I think they've managed to improve it without compromising its drivability, and it does bring the X640i into a bit of a place where it's kind of a happy medium before your more traditional driving around, everyday commuting sort of engines, and the M60i twin turbo V8 engine, which is gonna cost you an extra $34,000. So you get a good step up in performance for only a little bit extra cash. But anyway, those are my thoughts on the X6. Do you own one? Are you keen to jump into one of these? Let me know in the comments section down below. Don't forget to like and subscribe. But for now, that's all. Thanks for watching Chasing Cars.